we have been talking, the Spirit has been bringing us some powerful revelations. <clears throat> you know, we had a, a five-day service and God began to, or six-day service, and God began to talk about us being a tabernacle and that we're in a new season of power and prosperity. And it's not selfishness. Hello? It's not about selfishness. God gives us prosperity to change the world, not to just prosper oneself. There's nothing wrong with being prosperous, you know, and there's so many people that take this vow of poverty. God did not curse you with poverty. In fact, he took poverty so you can be wealthy. Amen. Hello. It's amazing to me that foolish religious spirit that says, Hi, I'm impoverished. This is how I'm going to show God I love him. Well, you ain't no good at him being poor. That's right. Come on. Who are you going to feed? Who are you going to clothe? Amen. Amen. What kind of temple are you going to build for Jesus? Hello. People aren't looking for... You're not going to draw people to you if you're poor. <laughs> Hello. You know, the world is looking for wealth, aren't they? But see, what God has been given us wealth for is to declare his gospel and expand his kingdom. That's what it's about. If your decision and your purpose for wealth is anything other than that, then you are a servant of darkness and not of light. Amen? Amen. It's amazing how many people you talk to and you say, you know, do you tithe? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, well, I give to UNICEF. UNICEF? It's nothing but a demonic charity. Hello? Now, do you tithe to your local fellowship? Well, why would I do that? Because that fellowship is feeding, clothing those who are in need, not only locally, but worldly. Amen? You know, it's amazing how people are afraid to give up their money like they think it's theirs. I worked hard for this. Who we'll bless you with the talent, bonehead? Hello? Well, I went to school. Who? So you were able to read? Yes. Well, who blessed you with the talent? Oh, it's amazing. Amazing. But anyways, God is bringing us into a new season right now, and it's a season of power and prosperity. And like I said, the prosperity is not about oneself. There's nothing wrong with being prosperous. But the purpose of being prosperous is to change the world in every way and any way you can. Look at the great men and women of God have all been wealthy. Amen? They've all been wealthy. Look at King Solomon. Look at King David. Look at Saul. All of them, great men and women of God, have been wealthy. But the reason why they were wealthy is because God could trust them with wealth. It wasn't for selfishness. And power. Powers overcome self. Powers overcome darkness. Powers overcome those foolish desires. And get right desires from God. You know, in this arena of season... God is preparing his children in purpose for destiny. You're here tonight to hear a message because God is placing you and positioning you in for your destiny. And you don't even realize it. You may think that you're here tonight for a specific reason, but God tricked you. Did you ever hear, you can't count a con? Hallelujah. Hey, if my dad created the most cunning serpent he's the creator of the cunning serpent you don't think he knows how to do it too hallelujah <laughs> oh praise god destiny what is destiny destiny is a predetermined course of events brought on by god associated with his perfect time in other words destiny is something that carries you everybody knows that we are destined to be transformed into the image and likeness of christ with his character everybody's destiny is for that that is your final destiny and in fact the bible says that when you die you will awake in his image and likeness when when he reveals himself you will see that you're like him now when you look in the mirror right now you have that struggle yes. hallelujah <laughs> but you'll get over it the more you die to yourself. <laughs> Unlocking destiny. There's a couple things you must do. You must have an understanding of God's timing and season. Timing and season. The other thing that you must be able to do is able to wait on God. Oh, 
wait on God. What are you crazy? I got things to do. You know, well, you're going to do them yourself. Two things you must understand is God's timing and season and able to wait on God. That's fulfilling or unlocking your destiny in your life. Is everybody with me? Oh, hallelujah. Now, go to Joel chapter 2, 28 and get a drink. Praise God. Go to Joel's place. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Joel chapter 2. Is everybody okay? How many of you all know that God brought you here tonight? I think it's God's perfect will for you to be here tonight. Hallelujah. We got a few of them that think so anyways. Hallelujah. You were predestined to be here tonight. Glory to God. And Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, I think so. Let me see what I got here. Yeah, that's cool. Would you read it with me? And it shall come to pass. Is everybody there? And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Is that happening? You betcha. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's the baptism of water and there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Too many people believe that if you get baptized with water, you automatically get baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's not true. Not that God can't. There's two baptisms. Water of remission of sin and a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you know it. There, when you, somebody says, you, man, you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you know what they usually say? Bachala mi ambrohositi kia. Oh, really? You've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Why? Because you've got to go back to the original. What happened to them in the upper room? That's when the church began. The church was built by the Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit builds the church. That's the foundation. And His Word are the building blocks. So we see that there's two baptisms. And He said, listen, I'm going to pour out My Spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall what? Prophesy. Calling those things that are not as though they are. Hearing from the voice of God. And it says, Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And on, also on all my maid servants and on my um, men servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And we know that we are in those days. And it says that we will have seasons of visitations. He says in this season which we are in a tremendous season. It's called the spirit of grace, the age of grace, the dispensation of grace. Where God's grace is a representation of God's plan and action. God's mercy is that he considers. That's why Jesus came in the fullness of truth and grace. Amen? Because God's grace was saying, okay, I'm bringing my plan in. From the spirit realm into the natural realm. And now we are in the ministry of the spirit. Jesus came and bridged everything. He fulfilled all the laws. He fulfilled everything. So we are now in a season of visitation. Why? Because when he poured out his spirit, that was representation of visitation. Now let me share something with you very important. <clears throat> the Lord says that with no vision, my people perish. Now it is a prophetic vision or what they might call a revelation. Go to Proverbs 29, I'll show you. Hallelujah. Proverbs 29. <clears throat> I'll explain to you what vision is here in a moment. Oh, to God be the glory. Something is about to happen. <clears throat> <clears throat> and Proverbs 29 and verse 18 it says where there is no it says revelation it's called prophetic vision where there is no vision the people cast off strengths or they 
they perish. Where there is no vision. But happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no vision. Where there is no prophetic vision. My people perish and go astray. Or are destroyed. So it's important that we have vision. Now, destiny is the carrier. You've been predestined. In other words, that's the carrier. It's like if you were to get in something and it would carry you. Destiny is the carrier. Vision is the purpose. Okay? And calling is the function. So, destiny plus vision equals calling. Is everybody with me? See, you've been predestined already. Everybody knows what they've been predestined to become in the image and likeness of Christ. You've been predestined with an inheritance and spiritual blessings and everything has been predestined, prepared for you already. Vision is the purpose of your predestination. And your calling is your function. Does everybody understand this? Oh, hallelujah. Okay. No vision, you get destroyed. Why? Because finding the map of your destiny requires a vision. Finding the map of your destiny requires a vision. That's a prophetic vision. Did you ever notice that if you stepped in water, you didn't get wet yet, but you know you stepped in it, then eventually it penetrated. It's like, whoa. It's like, you know, you, you stepped in it, you, you were busy, and all of a sudden, but you heard the splash, or maybe you didn't hear the splash, but the next thing you know, you're like, wet. That's kind of like, almost like vision. Because sometimes you're just stepping in it, you don't even realize what's going on. Then all of a sudden you realize, whoa, that's something that's, I'm supposed to, whoa, I get it now. That was a part of, in other words, you're starting to begin to see now what God's function, that now you're beginning to realize your calling. Does everybody understand? See, once you understand your purpose, then your calling is going to begin to manifest. Then you begin to understand your function. God places all of us in fellowship and in the body of Christ. The map of your destiny, finding the map of your destiny is to have a vision. And I'm not just talking about some kind of vision that appears before you. Ooh. You know, God doesn't show up before you and throw you a map and say, here we go. Okay, here's the vision. Go down to 33rd Street, take a right in it. He doesn't work that way. Get a notebook. Amen? Amen? He doesn't work that way. It'd be nice if he showed up and said, hi, this is what you're doing. Okay, this is what I want you to do tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Oh, that would be wonderful. You know, the problem is you'd be relying on all of these other things and not God. That's why the Bible says walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? Walk by faith, not by sight. It's different. No vision, my people perish. Finding the map of your destiny requires a vision. Is everybody with me? Finding the map of your destiny requires a vision. That's why people who are supposedly believers still ain't doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know why? They have no vision. They don't know what their destiny is. They don't know what their purpose is. They go to church every week. They throw in their few cents. Of course, they keep half of it for themselves. Because they're not sold out yet. They play religion. They do a couple of hallelujahs. You know, then they go home and they become real humble and they enjoy being poor. Well, that's false humility. They wait to go to church to get the word because they don't read it themselves. That's called stupidity. How are you going to know God's covenant if you don't have the word? Amen. So without vision, my people will perish. And finding the map of your destiny requires vision. Why? Because your vision is associated with your purpose. 
Amen? So you got to start somewhere. You don't wait for God to appear to you and go, Phew. okay, here we go. This is your vision. No. You start somewhere. But the thing is, is you got to get off your blessed assurance and do something about it. Well, I'm waiting on God. That's good. Those soap operas are really nice. Nothing but pornography now. You know, those things cause more divorce in this country than drugs do. I'm th hey, I'm telling you, it's nothing but simple pornography. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not going there tonight. Revelation 12. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Let's get a revelation or a vision. That's why it's called revelation. Hello? <laughs> Praise God. We got 22 chapters of vision. Revelation chapter 12. Tonight's teaching is called birthing your vision. You got to know how to birth your vision. See, you got to cooperate with God. So, and it's your responsibility to birth your vision. Hello? What that means, bring it to pass. Bring it from the spirit realm into the natural realm. It just doesn't pop. Hallelujah. Too many people are trying to fulfill everybody else's vision. There's nothing wrong with assisting, but you can't fulfill it. Now, God shares purposes. Amen. First of all, the vision is from God. He sets up a specific purpose. In this fellowship, we have a specific vision. Does everybody understand that? It's to disciple. That's what it's about. We love taking the outcasts. Why? Because I was one. We love taking the addicted. Why? Because I was one. Sentenced to life at the age of 20. In and out of jail. You name it, I did it. Lost my wife. Lost my family. Lost everything. Then I got a vision. And my life was never the same. Never. Oh, hallelujah. In Revelation 12, in verse 1. Is everybody there? <clears throat> now a great sign appeared in heaven. The word heaven means spiritual realm. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, I want you to understand right now we're talking about vision. Being with vision. I want you to look at the word child as vision, being with purpose. Okay? She cried out in labor, and in pain gave what? Birth to what? The vision. Wasn't Jesus the purpose in that vision? Amen. Mm. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and gave and, and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, in the spirit realm. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven headed, ten horns, seven diadems on his heads. See, he couldn't think by himself, that's why. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and a dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it is born. The devil is always going to come against your purpose, your vision. What he wants to do is produce spiritual abortion. If he can abort that vision, why? Because when people lose vision, when it happens to them, they go astray and they perish. You know, the devil loves to put things in your way to try to avoid you from fulfilling your destiny. Why? Because he steals your vision. He steals your purpose. You cannot fulfill your destiny without a purpose. Amen? Why? Because that's the road map of your destiny is vision. Now, you don't have to have the whole thing spelled out to you. You can have a little glimpse of it. First thing you gotta know is that you have a destiny. When you know you have a destiny. Amen. For many are called, but few are chosen, and others to call the chosen and the faithful. When you know that you have a destiny, 
and you begin to do what you're supposed to do according to the will of God and you're learning and you're functioning and you're doing this and you're, and you're going to services and you're going to church and you're praying and you're fellowshipping and you're getting delivered and you know, next thing you know, certain things begin to change in you and next thing you know, you've got a purpose coming. You might not know exactly what it is that day or that week or that month but you know that there's a purpose about to be birthed because God is getting ready to give you a vision. Oh, hallelujah. But the devil is going to always come against that purpose. He's going to try and steal that vision. Too many people give up. Yeah, I know. I know I got a destiny. Yeah, but you know that job pays a lot of money. But you know, I, I really want to marry her. I really want to marry him. Why well, is it God's will? I don't know, but I have lost that first bite. <laughs> so it must be God's will or he wouldn't allow that to happen. You know how many people get married? You know why it doesn't last long? It wasn't God's will or God's time. God's time. Why? Because to fulfill your destiny, you must know God's timing. Amen? You must know the season and time. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> so the devil's always ready to devour your vision. Remember, destiny is the carrier, vision is the purpose, and calling is the function. Destiny is the what? Carrier, vision is the purpose, and calling is the function. That's when you're operating in it. That's when you're operating in it. You know what happens? And you know you're calling. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Is everybody okay? <laughs> Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Thank you. James chapter 1. Is everybody okay? <laughs> oh, smell the flesh cooking tonight. You are becoming a sweet aroma. To God. Maybe not to your neighbor, but to God. <laughs> James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Well, who's tempting you? What's he trying to do? Steal your vision. He's trying to call spiritual abortion. Amen? For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, and God cannot be tempted by <clears throat> evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his what? Own desires and what? Enticed. Do you know that you see desires? Come on, everybody sees. Did you, you know, as soon as, man, you might have a desire for chocolate, and all of a sudden, whoosh, there comes a whole thing, man. Whoa. Snickers, this. I mean, you can almost name them off. Spell them from a distance. Smell it. Oh. Whatever it may be, it could be your <laughs> most tasting food, whatever it is. Everybody has. When there's a desire, there's a vision. See, because desires are associated with visions. Hallelujah. <laughs> now look at this. I, I, this is a good scenario. So we see here that, but each one, in verse 14, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So, 
when the desire of the Lord is conceived, hello, and it comes forth and brings birth, what does it bring? Life and function. Does everybody understand that? See, so what happens is you're walking in your destiny because you know you've been predestined and you're being on obedient to God because you want to fulfill your destiny and the devil's trying to knock you out. You're doing a Holy Ghost, Kung Fu stuff, you know, get him out of the way, stomping on him and everything else, casting him out. Don't curse the devil. It doesn't do you any good. Hello? I curse you, devil. He's already cursed. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you can't counsel one. The only thing you can do is remove it. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, praise God. So what happens is this desire that comes in you is a, is a part of a vision. And when you touch and agree with this desire that's from God, you say, yes. You may not understand it fully. As it begins, then what's going to happen, it's going to be birthed. It's going to be birth. Everybody in this room is pregnant. You're all pregnant. Some of you more than others. <laughs> Hallelujah. Desire is conception of your vision. Amen. Why? Desire is associated with your vision. So when that is conceived when you've touched and agreed and now it's beginning to grow isn't it and God is going to beginning to water that vision he's beginning to throw things in your place and your path and things are beginning to happen and so forth and and you know something's about to happen and something's about the birth and the purpose of the birth is going to be supportive to your vision amen now I want you to turn to Psalm 27 Destiny is the what? Carrier. Vision is the purpose. And calling is the function. Oh, to my daddy be the glory. Psalm 27. Thank you. Is everybody there? Would you read it with me, starting at verse 1? The Lord... Oh, wrong one. Hold on, hold on. Maybe it's 72. <laughs> Maybe it's 28. All right, where's the Lord's my shepherd? Come on. 23? See, it was right around the corner. Thank you. Hallelujah. Number 27. <laughs> Glory to God. It must be next week. I, I must have got in the spirit there and went ahead. <laughs> Ooh, a new vision coming. Number 23. The Lord is my what? Shepherd. I shall not or lack. That's what the word want means here. It means lack. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. What's he doing? He's, he's giving you purpose. See, he's already setting you up with your destiny. Now you're starting to walk. Why? Because you're obedient already to the unlocking of your destiny. So as you're being obedient there, now he's beginning to lead you into places. He's causing you to lie down. He's causing you to drink. He's, see, because he's letting you know you don't have to lack nothing. Everything's coming. Everything's coming. Oh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Oh, you're making connection. For you are what? with me when you're walking in destiny and you have that desire a vision for purpose one of the things that's manifested is you know he's with you you know 
There's no question about it. You know He's with you. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What's he doing? He's beginning to fulfill his vision. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Man, he made it to the table. Oh, he made it to the table. Now he's going to realize his calling. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Everything was being fulfilled. See, he knew. This is a man that just began to walk in that destiny. He knew he was predestined. He was anointed as a young child to become king. Thirteen years later, he became king. Took 13 years to become king. He was anointed. And man, did he go through hell before he could walk in that office. Even the king himself tried to kill him. But if he did, he would have lost. Everything would have been lost. He couldn't. Because David carried the anointing which was lifted from Saul. So David had to be around to fulfill the kingship office. Even though the king was still in her. That's a whole nother teaching. Hallelujah. Now, go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, we want the desires from God and not our own desires. Amen? And start verse 1 and it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as green herb. It says, Trust in the Lord and what? Do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. How many of you know He's faithful? Amen. Now, here's the kicker. Are you ready? Come on, say it with me. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, let me share something with you. i got seven things I want to share with you that are important about birthing your vision. The first thing you must be able to do is delight yourself in the Lord. Why? Because He says that He's going to Fulfill your desires. Well, as you begin to delight yourself in the Lord, it's not your desires that are going to be fulfilled. It's going to be His desires that are going to be imparted. You're going to lose your desires and you're going to get the desires from Him. Now what's beginning to happen is that desire which is associated with your vision is going to begin to come more and more to pass. You're going to be able to see clearer. You may have only a little glimpse, just a weeny leaning glimpse. Man, you know, maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. But it will start to grow. And things will begin to happen. It will start to grow. And like I said, it took 13 years for David to fulfill his vision and walk in his function. So sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. Hallelujah. Welcome to the house of death. <laughs> It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Receive vision of His desires. Amen? That's the first thing we must do. Go to Romans 12. Romans 12. Praise God. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Would you read it with me? For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So there's been a measure of faith already given to you to fulfill your vision. Does everybody understand that? To fulfill your destiny and to become a functioning part of the body of Christ. 
It's already been in you. You were born with it. Oh, hallelujah. Now go to verse 4. For as, as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. That's calling, isn't it? So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, we all have different gifts, don't we? That's to fulfill the vision and the purpose that God has called you for. Does everybody understand that? But see, he begins to put people together around so that to support your vision or to fulfill your vision. But it's really not your vision. You may think you got the vision because it's all yours and it's something that you might have thought you did, but it had nothing to do with you. He said he did it for his glory. For his glory, not for yours. It's amazing how good he makes us look, doesn't it? But it's really all him, not us. We can do nothing without him. Nothing. So the first thing we want to do is delight ourselves in the Lord to support the, the, right, the right desires, to support the vision of the desires that he gives us. He gives us a measure of faith to establish our destiny, fulfilling your vision and manifesting your calling. The second thing that we must do is maintain a level of faith not letting go. Remember, faith is holding on to nothing until it becomes something. Come on, say it with me. Faith is holding on to nothing until it becomes something. That's faith. If you're holding on to something, let me tell you, it will become nothing because you're doing it in your own flesh. God is trying to bring His church up to another level because we got more devils to contend with. Maintaining the level of faith. Not everyone is going to understand your vision. The Bible says don't throw your pearls before swine. Hello. Not everyone's going to understand your vision. So don't be blabbing it all over the place. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We'll talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> Go to Philippians 4. <laughs> Thank you, Master. Earthing your vision. Praise God. And you thought you came here for another reason. There's a change in hearts tonight. There's an impartation from the throne room of God that's been preordained by the counsel of the Lord and distributed by the spirit of counsel so that there may be a change in heart so that there may be sight to the blind. Why? Because blind are those who do not have vision. They are blinded. Listen. Listen. As you're going along according to your vision, your destiny, things can change. Because God is training you up to fulfill your purpose. That's why you're to acknowledge Him in all of your ways so that He'll establish your steps. And you're to commit your works to Him that He'll establish your thoughts. Everybody has a purpose in the body of Christ. There isn't one believer who doesn't have a purpose and a calling. You know, we only hang around so long. Somebody's got to replace you. It's not a one-man band. Jesus had disciples around him to impart so they could impart and so they could impart and so they could impart and it continues to go forward. Jesus had a focus and a vision. He had a destiny. When it was time for the vision to come to pass is when the Holy Ghost came upon him. And he began to walk in his purpose. And he knew his calling, which was manifesting. Does everybody understand that? He knew he was predestined. He knew his destiny, didn't he? 
He didn't go ahead of God. When somebody said something, he didn't turn around and say, devil, come out. When he was a kid. He didn't take advantage of anything. He saw many people die. People sick, demonized, and everything else as a child. He did not go ahead of God. He knew his destiny. And he waited. That's why he said, I don't see, do anything unless I see my father do it first. See, he knew his purpose. Because he had vision. Then he began to walk in his calling and in his function. But you know what? His purpose was to die. His destiny, he knew, was to die. Does everybody understand that? He knew he came to die. He knew. And when he was on a cross, he was the only one that could say it was finished. Why? Because he was fulfilling his destiny. His vision was being complete and his function was still manifesting. Now, his function is still going forward. It's been passed down. Does everybody got it? Oh, hallelujah. Go to, what did I say to go? Philippians 4. Praise God. In verse 6, would you read it with me? Be what? Anxious for something. Little thing. Big thing. Be once in a while. Nothing. No ting. Be anxious for no ting, man. But in everything by what? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Oh, how are you going to do it, God? When are you going to do it? Oh. When, how, when, where? Oh, ah, ah, you, ah. That's demonic tongues. Hallelujah. And somebody goes, oh, when, oh, why, oh, Come out, you anxious spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Be anxious for nothing. Right? But praying in the spirit will allow you to separate your ambitions from the vision of desire. Does everybody understand that? So the third thing you must do is surrender your own ambitions. You know, there's a lot of people with good, good in what? Intentions. Good intentions don't get you home. Man, I really want my. I really want to quit the dope. You got twenty bucks. I really need to quit those cigarettes. You got a light? <laughs> Hallelujah. <sighs> Surrender your own ambitions. God has given us help. Go to Romans 8, 26. <sighs> So the first thing, you want to delight yourself in the Lord. The second thing, maintain the level of faith. The third thing, you want to surrender your own ambitions. Yeah, but Lord, this is what I really feel like. Listen, he's not the God of feeling. He's the God of truth. If he was the God of feeling, we'd all be astray. Okay, because you feel that way. I'll do it. Okay, Davey. I'll do it that way. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. <laughs> Wait a minute, didn't he just say something about uh, don't be anxious for nothing but all prayer and supplication? Yeah. 
The demonic tongues, remember that? Listen, you don't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit knows what to pray, right? For we do not know what we should pray for, as we up, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered or understood. That's what He means here. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes what? Intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know all things work to the good, together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What's he talking about? He's talking about praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit means praying in tongues. as a gift to everyone. Well, I don't have it yet. Well, go get it. What you waiting on? Shake that religious spirit off and go get the stinking thing, will ya? Come on, it will change your life. Why, right, praying in tongues is what's going to separate your desires and ambitions from those from God. Hello? That's a free gift. When you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you get a handful of gifts, man. They're all yours. Twelve. You get extras. There's administrative ones and all kinds of other. Hallelujah. We're not going to get into all that tonight. So praying in the Spirit. Surrender your ambitions. What's going to help you? Praying in tongues is going to separate your ambitions from the visions, the vision of the desire from God. People travail in the Spirit. What are they doing? They're bringing birth to something. Man, did you ever notice that when you start praying in the Spirit, you just can't stop sometimes? You know what you're doing? Bringing something that was nothing into something. You're bringing forth, you're, you're supporting your vision and your purpose. Why? Your prayer says that when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying the perfect will of God. Aren't you? You pray the perfect will of God. In fact, it's the seven part of the full armor of God, isn't it? Amen. People don't like to talk about that. Oh, hallelujah. Go to Genesis 37. Oh, praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Genesis 37, please. Is everybody okay? Don't get offended. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and correctly can't, not, cannot correctly interpret the Word of God. Let me tell you, the only way you understand these revelations is by the Spirit. Because a carnal mind can't get it. It only goes by the letter, well, this says this. And this says this. But they'll never get the deep things. Only surface. Only surface. Those are bound by the letter. Only surface. Only the Spirit can bring you into the deep things of the Spirit. In Genesis 37 and verse 5, would you read it with me? Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> there it is, plain and simple. Be careful who you tell, man. You could be your neighbor, your brother, your mother, your father. Be careful. You got to listen to God. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have heard, which I dreamt. There, there, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, yours stood all around and bowed down to mine. Oh, not wise, Joseph. <laughs> not, not too smart right then there. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Better be careful. People won't understand your vision. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers again. You think he'd learned the first time? He said, look, I've had a dream, another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked them and said to them, what, you plumb crazy or something? 
What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I bow down to you too? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his spirit. His mind means spirit here. So, you know, you got to discern. And this is the fourth thing. You better discern who you share your vision with. Amen? You must discern that. Because people will trample it. People will try to steal it. And they won't even know it. I had a vision a while ago. When I was only about a year old in the Lord. Maybe two years old. And uh, I had this vision. I saw these two cans. And I saw the face of Jesus on them. And I thought, wow. So what do you want me to do with this, Lord? He said, you're going to make a drink. And on this can is going to be the word of God. I had no money. And I don't have all night to talk about the vision. But anyways, I began to pray. And the Lord began to tell me certain things. And it came to pass from the spirit realm to the natural realm. It's called the vine of life juice. And we began to put it in vending machines and all over. And the word of God was on it. A salvation prayer and a phone number for people to call. We get calls at 2 o'clock in the morning from finding a crushed can. We were getting, we'd pray over these cans. And they were put in jobs and so forth. We get calls from people. Somebody touch a can and the devil would leave them. Just like the handkerchiefs. And the aprons. People were getting saved. All kinds of people. And it only went on for a couple of years. Two or three years. And the Lord said put it on the shelf. And we did. But it was for just a season. We went through thousands of cans. But it came manifest. It came to pass. I'm talking it cost thousands of dollars to produce this. With no money. The only references I had was a Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. And they second day aired them to my house. Reynolds Aluminum wanted 100,000 cans to be printed. And they showed favor. They didn't charge me nothing. They hand printed them and anything. Hand filled them and sent me two dozen cases. Second day aired to my house with no money. It came to pass. And many people got saved. But see, I had to be careful who I shared this vision with. I went to a couple big churches with the cans and I said to them, look, hey, we can put these in your vending machines. Well, I mean, we could use these for fundraising and everything else. The first question was, how long have you been a believer? <laughs> what does that matter? Here's the evidence, man. Who's your covering? <laughs> Who's your covering? Who was Paul's covering? You know, I got associated, I got, came up against those religious spirits, you know. Because of these big churches, I was a baby in Christ. I didn't know about all this religious garbage. I was just spirit-filled, born again, walking in the spirit, wanted to love Jesus, wanted to rescue every soul there was on the planet. Dogs, cats, I didn't care what they were, I preached to them. You know, Jesus made you. Give me five. Don't step on that in. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Got to be careful who you shared it with. You know. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Is everybody okay? Are you in a rush? Good, because then you'd be associated with the spirit of anxiety. <laughs> Don't be anxious for nothing, right? <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2. Praise God. Glory. Thank you, Master. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Is everybody okay? And verse 2, uh, verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to who? Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, share your vision with those who are faithful. Those who will support you. Not degrade you. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So God's got this specific thing for you. Like I said, most people won't get your vision. You know, don't go around with, to some granola, a nutty and fruity person pretending to be spiritual. Amen? Get around those who are going to help birth your vision. Don't get around somebody that's still huffing cigars and drinking wine saying, thus says the Lord. Get around a fellowship that will support and help you birth your vision. Go to Exodus 4. <clears throat> We're almost done. 40 more scriptures. <laughs> I'm only kidding. It's all right now. <laughs> Don't worry. You can get your popcorn. It'll be waiting for you. Exodus 4. Verse 1, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Suppose they say you don't have a vision. Um, you're nuts. You know, somebody tried to kill me because I shared my vision with them. They said they wanted to teach me a lesson. And my wife and I both had dreams that night of what was going to happen the next day. But the Lord told me to go anyways. And I saw these demonic demons behind these individuals that were religious. They had Jesus all over their business and everything, man. The place was doing a tremendous business. And I had the juice cans in there and I went there to reload. I said, share us your vision. And I did, they said. It was an illusion. Next thing I know, all these other bigger demons came in the room and shut the doors behind me. They started telling me about how long hair isn't of God. And my vision wasn't of God. Of course, the one behind me, I could smell the spirit of nicotine for two hours. I was in that room with three men, which I saw in a vision the night before. My wife did. It's three wolves. And I said, Lord, should I start praying in tongues? And he said, no, they'll kill you. And I said, okay. Bind a strong man. Don't worry. I'll make a way of escape for you. I said, okay. And I just stood there. And these guys were beginning to get vicious. And they started calling Mother Teresa a witch and all this other stuff. And I'm thinking, my God, Lord. And then I saw in the spirit this man with a double shotgun shooting people who were in the spirit. I saw him abusing his wife and beating his children down with the word. Claiming to be a believer but bound by religiosity. Then he said, back up, I'm going to make a way of escape for you. And the next thing I know, I just walked towards the door and those men froze. I opened the door and I said a few words and I left. I came home, I was so drained. I opened my front door and I fell in the living room right to the ground. I was so drained. And mom and my wife came over and laid hands on me, prayed in the spirit and I got refreshed. And my heart hurt. And he let me know. See, I didn't know those things. I shared a vision, brought the product there, and they wanted to kill me. Bound by religion, couldn't understand the things of the Spirit because they were carnally bound. Couldn't interpret the Word of God. They had no understanding. Only what the letter was, like a normal book to them. Quote scriptures and page numbers, but really had no relationship. The Lord let me know they did not know Him. Didn't know Him. So be careful who you share your vision with. It's important. Oh, 
hallelujah. Let's go on. In verse 2, would you read it with me? So the Lord said to him, what is that in your, your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled. <laughs> there he went, right out the building, right out the presence of God, right? Okay, what's in your hand, Moses? A rod. Okay, throw it on the ground. <laughs> Turned into a serpent. Ah, I'm out of here. And the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. <laughs> you don't think he was ready to faint? And he reached out his hand with his eyes closed and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. That it may be, that they may believe the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Now, the purpose of this, you know, you got to look at what's in your hand. Use what you have and don't look what you don't have. Does everybody understand that? Don't look at what you don't have. Use what you have. What's already there. When you're faithful and use that up, God will give you more of your vision. But use what you have. You don't have to hunt or anything. What you have right now is all you need. As you're faithful with that, God will give you more. What's in your hand? Does everybody get it? God will support your vision, your purpose. Use what's before you. The table is set before you in the presence of your enemies. All of these things will assist you in birthing your vision. Somebody got it? Delight yourself and maintain the level of faith. Surrender your ambitions. Discern who you share them with. And use what you have. Go to Proverbs 13. Oh, hallelujah. I guess you didn't expect her to be this long. Me either. But I have to be obedient because this is a part of your life. Yeah. Proverbs 13. Is everybody okay? Amen. Would you read verse 4 with me? Hallelujah. Verse 4. Would you read it? The soul of a lazy man. Oh, wait a minute. A soul of a lazy man does what? Desires. Oh, he's got good intentions. And has nothing. But the soul of the diligent will be made rich. Has everybody got it? So just do it. Don't figure it out. Just do it. Use what you have. Amen? Praise God. He, uh, Habakkuk. No, that, that's a location. It wasn't a tongues or anything. Was... Hallelujah. Thank you. Turned right to it. I love it. Habakkuk. <clears throat> oh, hallelujah. In chapter 2, starting at verse 1, we'll read four, four verses. Is everybody there yet? Well, five of you are there. Praise God. <laughs> Read it with me. I will stand my watch. In other words, he's seeking, isn't he? And set myself on a rampart. And watch to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer when I am corrected. 
And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Sometimes you need to write that vision out. Write what desires are. Write it in your spirit. That he may run who what? Reads it. Make sure you write it sometimes because you want to share with others that are going to support it. For the vision is yet for what? Appointed time. But at the end it will what? Speak. And it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. Seek and write it in your spirit. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Write it. Don't be proudful of it that God gave it to you. Be humble that God gave it to you. Because pride will nullify it. You're not going to promote the vision. You're going to promote the Lord. He'll promote the vision. Amen? You just continue to promote the Lord. You give glory to God no matter what it is in that vision. Because that's your purpose. 1822. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. What you need to do is thank God for his perfect will. An opening of the doors that are him and closing of doors that are not of him. Why? Because you're calling those things that are not as though they are. Thank him for that vision. Thank him. Every day, thank him. Thank you, Lord, for sending help. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Just thank him. See, by thanking him and acknowledging him in that, you're protecting it. You're watering it. And he's going to begin to send individuals to support it. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. That's the seventh thing. Because the Bible says, as a man thinks, so he is. Well, as a man think, as a man speaks, so he becomes. Amen? As a man thinks, so he is. As a man speaks, so he becomes. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. Now I want to finish at Acts 9. So the seven things are delight yourself in the Lord. Maintain a level of faith. Surrender your own ambitions. Discern who you share your vision with. Use what you have. Write it down in your spirit and write it on paper. And thank God. Use your tongue to support it. You know what the devil always wants you to do is say, man, why don't you just speak, you know, that's it, that wasn't God. Oh man, I must have missed you, Lord, that wasn't you. You just broke. You need to repent for every time you cursed your own vision. Amen? You need to repent for cursing that vision. Things that God has showed you. Now, vision is for the purpose, isn't it? Amen? Your purpose. But there's going to be other visions that God is going to give you to support that purpose. Does everybody understand that? He may show you a house you're supposed to buy. He may show you a car you're supposed to buy. He may show you the person you're supposed to marry. Well, those are visions for things that you're supposed to... What's that doing? That's supporting... That's supporting your and fulfilling your destiny and supporting your purpose so that the, manuf the manifesting or the functioning of your call can be complete. Is everybody with me? And Acts 9, this is wonderful here. There's a wonderful example of um, destiny and um, vision and calling. And Acts Nine. Is everybody there? Good, I'll be there in a second. Praise God. Acts 9. Starting at verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who was of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem and kill them. He was taking children too. Didn't matter. As he journeyed, he came to Damascus, near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And he said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> he got a revelation right then, didn't he? <laughs> Okie dokie. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. Man, you don't think he changed? Whom you persecute. Is it, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. So him trembling and astonished said, Lord, What does he say? What do you want me to do? Destiny. Does everybody understand it? Why? He knew he was supposed to serve the Lord from that. Okay, Lord, what had just happened is destiny. He didn't know what his purpose was, did he? But he knew he had a destiny. And it wasn't no longer of his life. Because the first thing he says is, Lord, what do you want me to do? He knew he had a destiny now. Does everybody got it? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who were journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Let me tell you something. God was removing the old visions. Does everybody understand that? Because the visions that he had were not of him, they were of the devil. See, you can touch and agree with what the devil says and it will come to pass. He had spirits of religion. He actually thought he was doing the things of God. Those same men that came against me was the same spirit that Saul had. And they, Saul thought he was doing the right thing of God. He had a vision to capture everyone and kill those who were serving Jesus. Those funny people praying in that funny language. Those people that were joyful even when they were killed. Didn't understand it. Those people that were willing to die for their God. And Saul wasn't. He was self-promoting, self-ambitious, brought up with the Pharisees of the fairest. Granolas. They were nutty and fruity. But their fruit stunk. It was rotten. They liked to sit in their nice places. They lost the morality of human need and desire, and love, and compassion, and they're bound by the letter. They did not know the Messiah. They were hoping for one. But they were bound. Saul had to be blinded to lose the vision of the enemy and get a new one. Three days God caused him to fast and pray and not see. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So here he was blind, but God gave him a new vision, didn't he? You know what he gave him a vision? Of coming under authority. Now Ananias was a normal man like me and you because it doesn't talk about him again in, the, in, the, in, in the having dreams and visions and experiences. The Lord gave him a visitation. Amen? Gave him a visitation. In his visitation, he said, this is what I want you to do in his vision. And so he was obedient. And then Ananias came back and said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he is, authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And the Lord said, don't go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Come on now. 
he had to hear it from God because he wasn't about to believe nobody else. <laughs> oh, he can take the wretched and turn them into the righteous. <laughs> He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He was given him purpose. For I shall show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Listen, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer because you live in a world that is perishing, full of demonic forces carnality that are going to come against your vision and your purpose your destiny and your calling some of your own family will come against you they'll still be waiting for you to function in the old man instead of the new because they can't understand the things of the spirit and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him he said brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, didn't he? The next move was to receive his sight. Why? Because God was giving him new vision. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Saul began to teach about praying in tongues. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he rose was and baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Saul was misled by false vision, self-ambitions and self-promotion. Saul had to become blind and loosed from the old vision. Ananias had a vision to promote a destiny. Saul. Destiny was to serve Jesus. Didn't have a vision or a function yet. Amen. Until Ananias. Began to lay hands on him. And he got around his brothers. Because then he began to understand. See. It was told to Ananias. What his purpose was. But it wasn't revealed to Saul yet. The only thing Ananias went over there to do was lay hands so he could receive his sight. And he began to hang around his brethren. And the more he hung around, he began to understand his purpose because he began to see. Does everybody understand that? He began to see. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> his purpose was become... A master builder. He began to realize after he was hanging around with his brothers that his purpose now was to become a master builder. And his function was to become a spiritual father. Fulfilling your God-given destiny will cost you your life. That's your choice. Fulfilling your God-purposed destiny will cost you your life. You have to make the choice of whether you're willing to pay the cost. It's your life for his life. Is everybody with me? Saul's a wonderful example of how destiny and vision and calling is manifested and put into perspective. Birthing your vision will come by delighting yourself in the Lord, maintaining a level of faith, surrendering your ambitions, discerning who you share your vision with, use what you have, write it down in your spirit and on paper, and call, thanking God, using your tongue to continue to water that vision so your purpose can come to pass and your function of your calling can be manifested. Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We are honored and blessed. I ask, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus on every one of these seeds that it will grow and bear fruit for your glory. Master, you've put them on their destiny. I ask that you give everyone purpose, revelation, and vision, and put them around those who will support it, that they may manifest their calling and their function and place in the body of Christ. I bless every single one that was here tonight. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.